So my intention for today, specifically this Facebook Live here, is to talk about the subject of loving our bodies. And I've been really sitting with this topic for the past week or so really intensely, and I know that it's a vulnerable topic. It can be in some ways a controversial topic. And so I thought, well, what better way to talk or to initiate this conversation than to get personal myself? So some of you who know me know that I enjoy being an open book. There's really no secrets here. I love to share about my own journey and struggles and heartaches and failures and all that stuff. So... I'm hoping that I can get the conversation started, and I hope that you all who are joining me right now will ask questions and bring in your own insights into the conversation. So I'll just get us started talking about my own experience and some thoughts that I have on this topic, and then I would love to answer your questions or to... um, share with everyone your comments and insights that you have to bring to this conversation. So please uh, go ahead and at any point you can just type in the comments your questions or or insights that you'd like to share and then towards the end I will get into that. For right now I'm going to talk about my own personal journey with the subject of loving my body Hmm. So first and foremost, I thought that in to be in tune with this topic, that it would be very good for me to not wear any makeup whatsoever. So this is actually the first time I've ever done a public presentation and not worn any makeup. And it's interesting that it did bring up some insecurities in me. Um wondering if actually if not wearing makeup would be seen as unprofessional. Um, So it got me thinking about how as women, as females, we have this idea of in order to be presentable in public, we need to have something added to our face, quite literally. Our face is supposedly not good enough just the way it is. So we have to do stuff to it. And I also didn't do anything to my hair. I just kind of let it air dry. Um, I didn't like putting clips in it or anything like that. And I just, here we go. And it feels really good to sit here in front of you and have a naked face. I have a bit of lip gloss on, but that's just because my lips are really dry. This is how my face looks. (laughs) I don't have any makeup on. And when I was younger, when I was in high school, I was very insecure. And I would spend, and this is not an exaggeration, usually about an hour and a half to two hours every single day getting ready. So like... Um, putting on a ton of makeup, like very just precise makeup. I would, I would spend so long and then I would, um, straighten my hair because my hair is naturally curly and I would take it with like, first I would take a blow dryer and I would straighten it with the blow dryer each strand. And then I would take like a hot iron, like a hair strainer and I would straighten it. And my hair was super long. Like at one point it was like halfway down my back. So it took a long time. And, um, I would always have to look perfect in order to go to school or go anywhere really. And I look around me and I look at a lot of women in my culture and I see that they are where I was at in high school. Um, and I'm not saying this to be judgmental. I'm just pointing it out that, um, they don't feel that they can leave the house without, putting on a bunch of makeup and without making the hair look really perfect. Um, I'm also currently, I teach 
um, young children online have to speak English. So I work with little kids um, between the ages of like three and 12. And so I'm just interacting with little kids every day. And I'm a part of this Facebook group dedicated specifically to teachers who teach for this company. And I saw a post recently um, and one of the women was saying, how long do you spend getting ready in the morning to teach? And I was reading a bunch of the comments and a lot of the women were saying, yeah, I got to make sure my makeup is perfect and I got to get up and give myself extra time in the morning to make sure I look good, blah, 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 blah. And I was actually quite shocked because do you actually think that four-year-olds give a crap about what your face looks like? But for these women, they couldn't even be seen in front of small children who, as we know, are the least judgmental people that exist um, or tend to be. You know, they needed to spend a lot of time. And I posted, well, my face looks great as it is. And I basically roll out of bed and teach first thing in the morning and I don't do anything to my face or hair. I just go ahead. Um, and no one else really responded in that way. Um, and no one really liked my comment or like said I agree or anything like that. And so it just gave me the confirmation that we still live in a world where women, um, women identified or female or labels can get a little tricky here, but I hope you feel what I'm saying. Um, feel the need to put on a false mask in order to be present and um, interact with other people. So that that's... That's a reality. And then the other personal story I wanted to share is that when I was in middle school and high school, I watched all my peers around me developing breasts. And I never did. <laughs> I never did. For those of you who know me, I basically have a man's chest. Um, I have a tiny little something, but it's not, I don't need a bra or anything. But when I was that age, it was very hard for me. I felt ugly. I felt weird. I felt like, what the hell is wrong with me? Why am I not maturing in the way that everyone else is? What is wrong with me? It was deeply painful. And so I did a lot of things to try to change my situation. I bought really padded, like thick bras and wore them every day like to give the appearance that I had breasts when I didn't. And I remember being like 13 or 14 or something and going to an overnight sleepover, um, like a girl sleepover thing. And I remember sleeping that night with my bra on, like when all the other girls were like putting on their pajamas and like sleeping without their bras, I left mine on because I actually was so embarrassed about my flat chest that I wanted to leave my bra, so my fake looking boobs basically, on so that those girls who were my equals, who were my same age, and I didn't want to be vulnerable enough to even show them that I don't have breasts. And I felt this deep shame within me that I was different and that my body looked different. I did a lot of other things. I bought like creams to try to grow my breast bigger. I bought those like fake gel boobs that you can like, um, they're made out of, um, what's it called? Um, whatever the material substance is that um, women, when they have breast surgery, they get implanted. I can't think of the word right now, but it's the same kind of squishy material. I bought these like fake um, bra inserts and then I would like put into my bra and make me look like I had like a really big breast when I had like no breasts. Um, weirdly enough, no one ever said anything to me about it. Like you would think that one woman in my family or like a friend would say, what are you doing? Like you're not fooling anyone. 
but they didn't. Maybe they didn't realize it. I don't know. But I did so many things to try to appear that I had breasts. And the whole like game of trying to be something that I wasn't was exhausting. And at a certain point, I started to realize that I needed to heal within myself the need to look like everyone else. And so it was a slow and gradual process. It wasn't like overnight that I just was like, oh, I'm fine with it. But I remember there was a couple turning points for me. One was I was about maybe like 31 or something in that range. Um, maybe 30, 29, I don't know, somewhere like that. And I went to this gathering of spiritual people. And it was a beautiful spring day. It was like really warm outside. And we were just hanging out outside all day doing these different spiritual workshops. And a lot of the people there were really free spirited. And so they just started taking their clothes off. And so I was like really freaked out at first because I had never been around people that were so comfortable with their bodies before. So I was like nervous at first, but then I started feeling, oh, maybe I could do that. And I worked up the courage and I sh sh took my shirt off and my pants too. And I just walked around naked all day in front of a bunch of people that I didn't know. Like a couple people I knew, but mostly didn't know. I had like the sun on my skin and the wind in my hair. And like, I can't even tell you how healing that was for me. And you know what? Multiple people came up to me that day and said, you have a beautiful body. And not in like a creepy, like coming on, trying to seduce me way, but a genuine like affirmation because they, I'm guessing they probably could tell that I was dealing with some insecurity that I was healing within myself and I really could use that affirmation. And so they came up and even one woman said, you have a beautiful, you have beautiful breasts. And I was just like, thank you. It was, it was so amazing. Oh. So over the years, I started to make peace with my body. And nowadays, I don't give two shits <laughs> that my body looks different than other people's most of the time. Um, I don't wear bras ever. Um, I only do in the rare case that I'm in a setting where I know that my nipples will draw more attention than it's worth. And so I'll just put a bra on because I don't want to have to deal with certain aspects of people not understanding, but that's pretty rare. And um, I have lots of times where I don't wear makeup. And most of my friends just see me all the time without makeup. Really, the only times that I wear makeup is when I'm doing public talks or presentations. And that is, I will admit to you, based on my belief that if I don't wear at least a little bit of makeup, that I will be seen as unprofessional. And so my desire to appear professional so that I continue doing the work that I do and get invitations to speak places and have continue to be blessed with this work, I feel pressured to wear makeup. If I, there's really rare occasions that I actually want to wear makeup, um, genuinely want to take the time to put it on, it's pretty rare. Once in a while I do where I'm like, oh, I feel like kind of just playing with my face, but it's a very childlike kind of creative feeling and it comes like twice a year or something. It's very rare that I actually deeply desire to put on makeup. So I'm still dealing with trying to figure this stuff out, trying to figure out how I can be at peace with my body the way it is. How can I love my body just the way it is? It's not easy in our culture. And I'm speaking right now of the American culture. I can't speak for other cultures. So as I'm sitting here with you right now, I'm aware that you may be coming to this conversation needing and ready to heal certain aspects of yourself through your body. This body that we live in is, it is a temple. 
It is a great gift that we've been given as a human. So if we hold parts of our body with disdain or disgust or anger, then what we're doing is we are angry at our spirit. We're disgusted at our soul. We're feeling all these negative feelings that are really going inside of us. They're, it's not just about our hips or our knees or our nose or our breasts or whatever. It's deeper than that. The outer is a reflection of the inner. The inner is a, re is a reflection of the outer. We're doing this conversation today also because uh, a friend of mine wanted to have this conversation. And it is really clear to me also watching different discussions happen on Facebook. And I'm, I'm not going to state that I understand what it's like to be in another person's shoes, but I do see this overall theme in our culture of wanting to change our bodies rather than accept and love them as they are. In some ways, it's easy for the ego to say, I don't like how this is, I'm going to change it. Whether through a surgery of some sort, whether through different clothing, like buying new clothes, whether through feeling like you need to wear makeup, getting a hair dyed, like when older people, their hair starts to turn white and then they dye their hair. Again, I'm not in any way judging anyone for any of these actions, but I'm just noting that we have this tendency to want to change rather than going within and looking within and seeing how we might accept. The acceptance is more difficult. And that's why I think so many people don't do that part. They just want to change it. And they think, well, if I change it and make it better, I'll feel better. I'll feel more comfortable in my skin. I'll feel happier, more peaceful. But the problem with that is that when you try to change an external, something else just pops up in its place. Once you get something fixed, fixed, then the next thing happens and you want to fix that. And then the next thing, and it's a never ending um, chasing the carrot, if you will, of perfection. When we can stop the cycle right now and start to realize I want to work on accepting and loving my body just the way it is. Now, again, that's not like you can snap your fingers and instantly be healed. It took me years to really accept this chest just as it is. Just as it is. Years. But I, I'm actually proud of my chest now. I think it's awesome <laughs> for so many reasons. So I encourage you to do that healing work on yourself. Rather than trying to manipulate the exterior, can you look within and see what this body part or this body issue is trying to tell you? How is it trying to get your attention? And then give yourself that love, the love that you so want and deserve. So now I would love to take your comments and questions. Let's see here. Okay. Terry, Terry says, I love to put makeup, put on makeup. It is like painting on a canvas that is me. So I do it religiously, but mostly because I love makeup. Very cool. Yeah, I do know people like you. There's lots of people who they love 
that feeling of like creativity and expression that comes through makeup and putting together an awesome outfit and all that stuff. I mean, for me, I love um, the like putting different clothing combinations together. Like I love picking different weird things like that would seem like they would clash like a shirt and a you know skirt that like like oh that clashes but then if you kind of like put it together it actually looks really weirdly good I love doing that so yeah um I hear you Terry I think that's really cool and again I'm not in any way judging anyone who wants to who enjoys wearing makeup I am hoping just to like spark this conversation so we can each look within and see maybe where are the areas that we want to look at that maybe we aren't accepting ourselves just the way we are and we're kind of like doing things just to maybe please others or because we have some kind of judgment against ourselves for not being a certain way. So thank you for your comment, Terry. I love that you're here right now. Yeah, Terry says, yes, for me, it's a celebration of my body that I love. I love that you love your body. I love it. It makes me so happy to hear that. Yeah. So many of my friends right now and I are working on like more and more and more and more loving our bodies just the way they are. And it's a really, it's a really radical, radical experiment in life. It really is. Yeah. Okay. Don. Don says, I was exposed to chemicals in the places I toured in the military. Loving my body helped, but there's things going on, love, and I can't fix. Thank you for sharing. Hmm. Yeah. I had a friend of mine who was in the military and he, um, he was exposed to chemicals. Um, and then his whole temperature system got out of whack. Like it would be 20 degrees outside and he'd be sweating wearing shorts. And that was really difficult for him because he felt really betrayed by the government, by the military, that, that kind of thing. I think he was just shocked that that could even happen. He felt really betrayed. My heart goes out to you, Don. And I hope that you find the resolution within you, and I know that you can. Maybe not fixing it on a physical level, Maybe you'll always deal with the issues that you deal with. But I know that you can find peace with it. I have been blessed to encounter many beautiful beings on my journey that have dealt with serious physical chronic illnesses. And they have managed to find peace. A sneeze wanted to come there. Oh, but it didn't come out. <laughs> that's funny. Live, uh, that's what happens when you're live. Um, but I've seen firsthand. There was one girl in particular that I came across. She has uh, Lyme's disease. And she's about, I don't know, late 20s. Gorgeous girl. Just shining light from every pore of her skin. And she has found a way to be completely peaceful with her condition. She's made complete peace with it. And um, her work is sharing her story with other people. And talking about her relationship with spirit. And how she is dedicated to, to living her life despite this great challenge that she has. So, Don, I know absolutely within my heart that things are not an accident. That these major things that happen to us in life are happening for a reason, many reasons, really. 
And the understanding that comes with time when you start to believe that it's possible that you can make peace with something. All you need is that little inkling of a feeling of maybe I can make peace with that. It's a little question mark in your mind. And if you just start with that little hint of possibility, it expands over time until you get to the point where you do have the peace. So I wish you all the love, Don. Um, Sarah, Sarah, Sarah says, we were quite inspired by Louise Hayes, who talks about looking in the mirror. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. I love her mirror work. Um, I think her name's Louise Hay, or something Hay. Yeah, the, the famous author from Hay House. Yep. Yeah. Um, talks about looking in the mirror and honestly being able to look in our eyes and tell ourselves, I love you. I really love you and I mean it. I do it sometimes and should do it more, but I feel like I mean it when I do it. Yeah. It's awesome that you have this practice, Sarah. I really, really believe that some of the most healing moments in a person's life are those moments when they can look in the mirror and say, I love you. And that is definitely not a um, practice or a skill that is taught in our culture at all. We're taught to look outside of ourselves for someone else to look within and say, I love you. And that's the only thing that counts according to our culture, right? The only thing that really matters a lover or a parent saying, I love you. But what about loving ourselves? And your practice, Sarah, is like kick ass because you're taking responsibility for your own sense of fulfillment and completion. No one else is going to love Sarah like Sarah. No one else is going to love Anya like Anya. Mm hmm. The other day, um, I was I had a really rough night of sleep, and I woke up just exhausted, just like nightmares all night, and just processing stuff. And I woke up, my alarm went off, and I was exhausted, and I had to teach like so much in the morning. And before I started my self love practice, which was like maybe. 10 years ago or something, um, if I would have had an experience like that, what I would have, would have happened is I would have woke up in the morning exhausted and then start like negative self-talk. Like, I can't do this. I'm too tired. What's wrong with me? Why didn't I get a good night of sleep? I'm such a failure. I'm a loser. Like I had such negative defeating self-talk. I mean, oh, so heavy. And now, like I noticed that I noticed that I was exhausted, but my first reaction was to start talking to myself. And so I basically was saying, Anya, you're strong. Anya, you're courageous. Anya, you can do anything. And I just repeated that as I laid in bed, kind of like hit the snooze a few times, you know. And I was just like blasting myself with happy, loving, affirmative talk. And that's what we can do with our bodies. So if there is a place in your body that you dislike, that's a key, okay? So for some of you, it's going to be your feet. Many people have like a feet issue, like, oh, I hate my feet. They're ugly, Ugh, you know. Okay. What would happen if you made the commitment to yourself just as an experiment to take a month and every day in the morning or in the evening sit down and stare at your feet for like a few minutes stare at your feet and tell your feet 
that you love them. And then after, you can journal about your experience doing it. Did you feel like you were faking it? Did you did it feel weird? Did it feel uncomfortable? Did it feel kind of weirdly good? Did it feel like you were making progress? Do you feel an overall acceptance for your whole body now that you're focusing love on your feet? What are the changes you're experiencing? If you dislike your thighs or your hips, women, females have an issue a lot of times with that. What if for a month, every day, you made the commitment to yourself just as an experiment in self-love, you could just look at your hips, touch them, lovingly touch them, stroke them, and then whisper, I love you. I love you. You're beautiful. You're awesome. Thank you. Thank you for holding me up all day. You're so cool. I'm so grateful to you. Wherever that is on your body. If you're tuned into this talk right now, chances are there's a little bit more self-healing work we can do. We can all do it. I can do it. Absolutely. Yeah. Something I could work on is my teeth. They got stained over the years from chain-smoking cigarettes, yes, that used to be me, and drinking loads and loads of coffee. So my teeth turn pretty yellow. And so sometimes when I'm in, like, photographs or um, just... I notice that my teeth are yellow. I have this like instant aversion, like, oh, that looks so gross. But is it gross? Why is it gross? Who said teeth have to be white? Who said that? Hmm. Did I just learn that from the Crest commercials or the commercials trying to sell me teeth whitening paste or surgery or whatever? Where did I learn this? So we get so many subtle messages from our culture about what looks good and what doesn't. And it takes dedication and time to peel back these layers and really embrace our bodies just as they are. And that can be tough. That can be tough. Especially, too, if we're locked in to a certain idea of what it means to be a man or a woman or masculine or feminine. But if we can have a sense of flexibility, fluidity about these things, it gets easier. It gets easier. One of the things I love to do is follow different um, people who channel different beings, different masters that have different wisdom. And one of the things that I love is communication with other entities in other planets and dimensions. And something that comes up regularly, regularly, is that these different beings have completely transcended notions of gender. So basically these other kind of civilizations, they're just... They don't think of, like, gender. They just are. They just are. I bring this up because gender is a major part of this discussion. Yeah. For me, I experimented for a long time with wearing boy men's clothing um, to see what it would feel like. And it was fun. And then I realized for me, I really do like dresses. Right now I'm wearing a really cute lacy dress because it just feels good. But I'm totally not attached to it in that um, if someone said for the rest of my life I have to wear guys clothing, I'd be like, okay, <laughs> I'll work with that. So I like how Terry was saying with the makeup, it's just like a fun, creative um how did you put it, Terry? Uh, yeah, like a painting on a, a canvas. 
that's how I, you know, see my clothing choices. So I think a part of this discussion is having a sense of playfulness about our bodies and how we look and our culture takes everything so seriously. We have to fit into these little boxes and then the life energy just gets squeezed out. Where's the life? Where's the joy? Where's the play? So, uh, let's see who else has comments. Sultan says, hmm, people can always find peace, but they tend to choose their misery. Yeah, that is still quite a dominant truth on this planet, isn't it? Yeah. I think at a certain point, people just get sick of the misery and they reach a turning point when they can't I mean it doesn't even feel like a choice it feels like life or death really for many of us choose peace choose life choose health choose happiness choose positivity or choose misery darkness victimhood defeat blame anger and it becomes that clear Pick one. And then we go from there. And then the lines get blurry again and it all kind of blends together and you see the dark and the light and the light and the dark. But there is a certain point when you make a choice. And Sultan, I hope you've, well, it, clearly from your comment, it seems that you have made the choice to follow the light. So, well done. Uh, Lena says, me and my boy just happened to be doing skin to skin. And my boy loves me regardless of what his mama looks like. Good reminder that when we're being free, we usually don't think those thoughts. Yes. I just got the chills from head to toe. Yeah. Children are so innocent. Which is why in the beginning of this discussion, I was talking about how shocked I was that, um, the, the women teachers who I was teaching with um, to the child, little small children online were spending so much time like getting ready, like putting makeup on and making sure that they had their perfect, like just, I don't know, it, the way that they were saying it, it seemed like um, they were still really stuck in that idea of like having to look perfect all the time. That was the energy I was feeling. And yeah, Lena, when we're being free with each other, like we don't care. Think about all the times in your life when you've been hanging out with your best friend, laying on a blanket under the sky or driving around or like singing to a song in the living room, hanging out with your best friend. Like, are you trying to fix your hair or like, oh, does my lipstick look okay? No, you're completely in the moment. You're completely just free. And loving or with your lover you know laying on a pillow after making love you're both sweaty probably stinky um, you know and you're looking at your beloved are you judging what their hair looks like in that moment no are they judging if your makeup looks okay no maybe one of you even farts <laughs> And then you laugh, and it's fine. So your comment, Lena, just makes me think about we have this like strange divide between public and private ways of being. In private, we can be with our friends, our family, our lovers, and we can feel like we can just be ourselves, like have a bad hair day, and who cares? But when we step out the front door into the public world, it's a different ballgame. Or it seems like it should be a different ballgame. And I don't know how healthy that is. My intuition says it's a very weird gap. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Does anyone else have any comments or questions that you want me to dive into?
Terry says, I think people choose their misery because they have never, be, sorry, um, I think people choose their misery because they have been taught that they are not worthy. Yeah, I agree for sure. Thanks for sharing that. I agree. I agree. I was uh, just talking with a friend a couple hours ago. We were having a really great picnic in the park and we were talking about worthiness and um, so many of us are taught that we are not worthy. So we're trying to win the love and affection of our parents and when we were kids we felt like we were failing miserably. I know I did. There was so much love that I wanted to receive that I did not get. And I got the opposite. I actually got violence. The opposite of affection. But through that terrible suffering, I made that choice. I made the choice. Do I want to just sink into the misery and suffering or do I want to rise? And I chose to rise. I love you too, Magdalena. You're beautiful. I saw a picture of Magdalena on Facebook. Um, was it like yesterday or two days ago? Uh, celebrating her daughter's 10th birthday. And she had this uh, old picture of herself pregnant from 10 years ago. And actually, as I was scrolling through, <laughs> I... Um, I didn't read what she wrote first, and I thought she was pregnant again. <laughs> and I was like, oh my gosh! But then I realized it was from 10 years ago. But that's, it, was, it was a funny moment. Uh, I got really excited about, <laughs> about that. <laughs> but I loved, Magdalena, that you posted that picture. And I think it's really cool when women post like big belly pictures, like with your shirt pulled up and the belly coming out. Or even a friend of mine, um, when she had her daughter recently, she was posting breastfeeding pictures. Like, yeah! And I was just hoping that nobody on Facebook would report her as being, um, like, uh, you know when you can report something as, like, pornography and, like, get her in trouble and have her account closed down? I was praying that no one would freak out and do that. Because I thought it was so great. She was showing her body with her new infant, and it was, like, really, ooh, it was powerful. It was really powerful. I actually have some photos of myself topless that I really wanted to share. Um, well, there was one photo where like you can just see my back and I'm walking towards a forest. So you see like I'm wearing pants, but like my whole back is exposed because I'm not wearing a top. And I wanted to post that to advertise this, um, this talk. And then I stopped because I thought some person who's full of judgment is going to report me as being offensive in some way and then I could lose my Facebook account. And it's more important to me to have this venue to share with all of you than to post a somewhat nude picture of myself. And it sucks that I have to make a choice like that. It sucks. But that's the choice I made. And I'll stick with it. But that is the world we live in. Bodies are shamed. Bodies are ugly. Bodies need to be airbrushed. Hmm. Yeah, uh, Magdalena says, um, nipples in infant mouths are not profane. Yeah, exactly. All right, my loves. Thank you all so much. For joining us today. I can feel so much love and energy coming from this conversation. It is magnificent. So I just want to leave you with a few questions to reflect on within yourself. Again, going back to what I said a few minutes ago, what are the parts of your body that you have an aversion to or a dislike or a downright hate? What are those parts? And then can you make the commitment to yourself just as a self-love experiment? Can you every day for a month give that part of you loving attention and affirmations? How would that feel? 
what could change in your life as a result. So I want to encourage you to do that. And then I also want you to um, encourage you to get, to be more observant about your uh, any judgments that you might have against others that come up as you go through your days. Maybe you see someone, for example, who is a very large person. And you have a thought about them that is really negative that comes up. Like, um, they must not exercise. Or they're lazy. Or what's wrong with them? Or, so, you know, you have that little voice that comes in. Just observe that voice and then let it go. Don't judge yourself for having that thought, but just observe it, notice it, and then make the choice to release it. Because we all walk our own journey, we all walk our own paths. And perhaps, you know, as I was talking about the women who I teach with who need to wear the makeup before they teach the kids, Maybe there is a part of me that is judgmental. And I can work on that within myself to allow them to have their own experience, but also to still observe what's going on around me and reflect on it and use it for my own growth and well being. And that is truly my intention always is to um, notice patterns in others or um, dynamics. And then without judgment, really looking at it and then looking within myself to see what I can do with myself to heal. Because it's really never about the other people. It's about us. Thank you for joining us today. If you would like to work with me one-on-one, -on -one, whether in person or online through Skype or phone, you can get in touch with me at my website, anyalight.com, A-N-Y-A-L-I-G-H-T.com. If you have any questions about my work or anything at all, you can also message me through my website, and I'd be happy to talk with you. All right, it's the first day of July. Summer's really kicking in. Enjoy, enjoy. Thanks. Thanks.